but thanks everybody for being here today. Um, my name is Isaac Hart, and I am currently a postdoctoral research associate and manager of the research laboratories in geography and anthropology at the University of Utah. And today I'm going to talk about Holocene paleoenvironmental change and human behavior in Western North America. So my research agenda focuses on changes in land use and settlement and subsistence patterns over time in relation to paleoenvironmental change. And specifically, I use theoretical models from behavioral ecology uh, applied to archeological materials. In order to apply these models though, we need to have fine grained records of paleoenvironmental change over time. Um, basically it boils down to, we need to understand the opportunities available to people in, under, to, in order to understand their decisions. And so to that end, since 2010, starting as a graduate student and now uh, for the past several years as a postdoc, I have focused my research efforts on uh, gathering and generating new records of paleoenvironmental change. So working in the University of Utah's uh, Records of Environment and Disturbance Lab, that's our geography department's paleoecology lab, I have been collecting and analyzing sediment cores uh, with the standard paleoenvironmental proxies um, pollen, for example, to reconstruct uh, vegetation and habit habitat productivity, and charcoal to reconstruct fire histories, et cetera. But I also work in our zooarchaeology laboratory, analyzing animal bones from uh, zooarchaeological and, pale and uh, paleontological sites to generate records of model community change over time. All of this, of course, though, uh, I'm an anthropologist, and all of this is in order to understand human decision-making and land use change through time. Um, so this is these this slide shows on the right there um, our tactical core extraction team. Um, I'm always the biggest and heaviest person on, and most insured on these uh, expeditions. So I'm always the one that gets the honor of riding the tube as we drive it into the dirt to collect the cores. Um, and I'm going to be talking uh, exclusively about Western North America today. But I should mention that I and colleagues um, from University of Colorado at Boulder and the Max Planck Institute in Jena, Germany, uh, have just started a project in the Mongolian Altai of Western Mongolia, looking at the timing and paleoenvironmental context of horse domestication and the adoption of mounted pastoralism in Bronze Age Mongolia. And so the, the image at the left there is me piloting our little raft-based coring rig out into the middle of Dayan Lake in the Mongolian Altai. And I collected the sediment core there, and hopefully um, we submitted radiocarbon dates from that site uh, a few months ago. And I don't know what their backlog is right now with COVID, but I should get the results back pretty soon. So the two case studies that I'm going to talk about today deal with uh, Holocene El Nino frequency in Baja, California. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Fish Lake uh, in central Utah and the prehistoric use of fire among the Fremont. Um, and it looks like one of my co-authors on this paper is actually in the Zoom talk today, so that's good. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about the behavioral ecology of fire use among humans. So in this uh, first case study, I'm gonna talk about my ongoing work with the faunal assemblage from the Escorpiona site in uh, Northern Baja, California. This section is going to hopefully I demonstrate the utility of my paleoecological approach to getting at human settlement patterns using uh, the patch choice model. Um, and in this case, by identifying a key relationship between a faunal population and a specific climate system, uh, we have unlocked the key to understanding uh, human use of the site and perhaps uh, a key for understanding coastal and inland habitation of Baja California across the Holocene. One central question in archeology span and even in evolutionary anthropology is the relative importance of marine or coastal and terrestrial or inland uh, resources at different points in human prehistory. It's also one of the central points of debate in competing models of the settlement of North America. Did people, for example, hunt their way south um, to South America following and decimating uh, migrating herds of very large animals? Um, through interior passageways, or did people exploit and exhaust the rich virgin littoral zones um, found along the Western coast as they moved slowly south patch by patch until they found themselves uh, at Tierra del Fuego? 
And the, in, in fact, the Scorpione site that I'm going to be talking about uh, was originally excavated um, by Ruth Green and Alan Bryan at the University of Alberta uh, from 2002 to 2004. And they were hoping to get into terminal Pleistocene sediments and find evidence relating to coastal migration for, uh, for the earliest Americans. And I think the patch choice model can really help us uh, understand this question of the relative importance of marine versus terrestrial patches to, to early humans in North America. Oops, don't scroll. Um, and the patch choice model, is, this is a formal theoretical model. Um, it can be described graphically and mathematically, um, but it essentially boils down to um, organisms in a patchy environment should exploit a patch if it increases their average rate of returns. Um, and they should ignore, ignore patches that, that, have, that can generate lower than average returns. Uh, resource patches can be big or small, um, and for that reason, this, this model provides us a, a good model for landscape level uh, organization. Um, but one thing we need in order to apply this model to archaeological materials is we need to get at patch productivity over time. Uh, and to, to apply this model, um, in this case, uh, we need to find what drives the greatest amount of variation in energetic return rates available to humans in marine and terrestrial resource patches in Baja, California. And you probably guessed from the, the title of this section, uh, I think El Nino is the factor that drives the most variation in uh, habitat productivity and patch productivity in marine and terrestrial patches in Baja, California. And to get at what El Nino is, we need to understand what normal conditions are. So what's El Nino not? Um, under normal conditions, Pacific equatorial easterly winds drive warm surface waters to the west, which causes a big pool of, of cold water uh, as a result of upwelling off of Western South America. And it causes a large warm pool of water to develop in the Western Pacific. As El Nino conditions develop, uh, those equatorial easterlies weaken, which uh, causes that um, the cold water upwelling to slow down or sometimes cease altogether. And it causes a big warm pool of surface water in the east. And those warmer surface waters cause a, a dramatic decline in marine productivity in the Western Pacific Basin, but they also drive uh, heavy precipitation and increased terrestrial productivity in the Eastern Pacific uh, and Southwestern North America. This figure shows uh, global winter precipitation anomalies in the average El Nino year. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, in the Eastern Pacific and up into Southwestern North America, including Baja, uh, we get two, three, and sometimes even four times uh, the normal amount of precipitation during an El Nino year. And this dramatic pulse in precipitation causes really dramatic, uh, very fast explosion of vegetative growth on the landscape. This image was taken in Death Valley, California in 2017 um, after about 18 months of El Nino conditions, which drove really heavy spring and winter precipitation in Death Valley. Uh, but thousands of miles to the south, uh, this image was taken in 2015, the same El Nino event, but at the start of the El Nino event uh, in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And what you can see is just a vast blanket of vegetative growth in an area that is otherwise completely barren of vegetation. Another effect that El Nino can have is on sedimentary records in the equatorial Andes. This image shows the Laguna Palcacocha record uh, reported by Moy et al. in 2002. In this lake basin, precip persistent precipitation events cause erosion and deposition of white marley glacial flour. And <clears throat> these researchers compared the thickness and the frequency of these depositional events to the historical record of El Nino's and got a very close match. And then re retrodicting that relationship back in time allowed them to generate a record of El Nino frequency over the past 12,000 years. And that record is shown here. Uh, two key conclusions to draw from this are, uh, first of all, there's a lot of variation over the Holocene in El Nino frequency. And second of all, um, the more or less modern periodicity that we see El Nino happening today, which is uh, we tend to have an El Nino event every five to seven years, um, that periodicity basically began around 7,000 years ago. Prior to 7,000 years ago, 
El Nino was largely absent from the global climate system. And after 7,000 years ago, uh, we see that dramatic variation over time. And this data set is reported in uh, El Nino events per 100 years. Um, and that's just important because we had to, to, to do this analysis, we had to be able to assign all our faunal specimens into 100 year bins. Um, so given the effect that El Nino has on marine and terrestrial habitats over time, how then can we expect human populations to have responded to this variation in El Nino frequency? And to answer this question, we need to identify an assemblage uh, that records both the relationship between El Nino frequency and marine and terrestrial resource patches, but also the human response to those relationships. And something's frozen. Uh, and the site that I've chosen to do this with is uh, the Abrigo de los Escorpiones site in Northwestern Baja, California. The site is um, about an hour by highway south of the town of Ensenada. Um, so it's pretty accessible to get to. Um, it's right outside of uh, the town of Arendra. It's, it's a really cool site. Uh, it's, the site sits in an extinct volcanic caldera up in a rock shelter um, underhanging um, the rim of the, of the caldera. And the site uh, is about, as you can see in this image, 100 meters uh, from, from the Pacific Ocean. And the proximity to the marine resources for this patch and the distance to terrestrial resources means humans should functionally treat this site as a marine patch. The patch choice model suggests that when marine productivity is high, people should target this resource. And when marine productivity is low, people should abandon it. Um, so if we can figure out the dominant driver of marine productivity here, we can make some meaningful predictions uh, about human use of the site over time. This is another view of the excavated portion of the site. Uh, this picture was taken standing on one edge of the caldera, looking across at the other. And I have a little pointer here. Um, the excavated portion of the site is um, basically just in the center of the image. Um, I guess I can use my cursor instead. Um, I mentioned this before, but they, it was originally excavated uh, in the hopes that they would find terminal Pleistocene deposits with uh, evidence of early um, coastal migration by humans. Um, unfortunately, the dates go, don't go back quite that far, um, but they do go back pretty far, about 12,000 calibrated radiocarbon years ago. Uh, and there's evidence for very early uh, human use of the site, but um, as we'll see, very sporadic use of the site by humans. And this little zoom in, um, I put this as a marker to remind me to talk about the depositional uh, vectors at this site. Uh, the site is an archeological site, but it's also largely a paleontological site. Um, a lot of the small animal remains deposited in this assemblage were collected by birds foraging and scavenging on the landscape. And you can see this on the top of this little knob of rock directly over the excavated portion of the site, there's a guano covered um, rock. And so you can imagine um, raptors foraging out on the landscape, scavenging for food, finding something, some nice morsel to eat, bringing it back and sitting on top of this rock and eating their prey on what is uh, the highest spot on the landscape for about three miles in any direction. Um, <clears throat> and then dropping what they don't eat down below or in the case of many raptors, uh, many, rap many raptor species regurgitate uh, pellets of the skeletons of animals they've eaten. Um, and so this assemblage is a very rich deposit of um, especially small mammal remains. So given the, the, the dramatic influence that we could, should see in El Nino on uh, precipitation and vegetative growth at this site, we can make um, some pretty basic expectations for the lagomorph fauna of the site. These are the rabbits and hares, and this is what I began my research with at this site. Um, first, um, because of the rapid vegetation pulse that's associated with El Nino events, we should expect higher total uh, numbers of identified specimens of rabbits and hares deposited when El Nino is more frequent. So we expect to see absolutely more lagomorphs on the landscape and in the, in the Escorpionis faunal assemblage. 
A second expectation that we might have is we should see more of the mesic taxa of lagomorphs uh, when El Nino is more frequent. Um, there are three lagomorph species that currently occupy Northern Baja California. Uh, these are the black-tailed jackrabbit, the desert cottontail, and the brush rabbit. And you can arrange these species on a gradient of xeric to mesic, uh, the black-tailed jackrabbit being the most xeric oriented and the brush, the brush rabbit being the most mesic oriented. And this boils down to uh, ecological preferences that these uh, lagomorph species have. Uh, the black-tailed jackrabbit um, is associated with very open xeric habitats, largely denuded of vegetation. And you may not know this, uh, but the black-tailed jackrabbit controlling for size is the fastest animal in the world. Um, they can run uh, sometimes 45 to 50 miles an hour, which if you scale that up to the size of a deer, that'd be like running 200 miles an hour. <clears throat> and this is, boils down essentially to their uh, predator avoidance strategy. So when black-tailed jackrabbits are spooked, they run and they run and they run for sometimes over a mile, sprinting you know, a mile in almost less than a minute. Um, so they're very fast and they really require uh, xeric open settings in order to be able to run that far that fast. Uh, they are so, in fact so fast that they actually needed to evolve uh, some, some cranial, uh, the, this feature of, of jackrabbit skulls we call cranial fenestration. So their skulls have all these holes in them, little windows, um, and that's functionally to lighten the skull um, and then they also evolved a weakly fused occipital bone to absorb uh, impact when they're running full speed and they turn because they run so fast and they turn so fast that without the light skull and the weakly fused occipital bone to allow their head to move independent of the neck, their neck would snap. And this has been actually observed in treadmill studies of black-tailed jackrabbits uh, at the University of Utah. They've, they've watched these guys running them on treadmills accidentally die. Um, and then as the, so that's the black-tailed jackrabbit. The brush rabbit um, is the most mesic oriented on this spectrum. And as their name implies, they like really brushy dense cover. Um, they don't run away. They run a very short bit and then they hide, duck into the veg and hide. Um, and they also require, uh, they forage on greener kind of more lush vegetation than do the black-tailed jackrabbits or even the desert cottontail, which are intermediate um, in every respect in size and habitat preferences. So given those observations, uh, we can create a taxonomic abundance index of the most mesic species of lagomorph at the site um, with the brush rabbit in the numerator. And that index should positively correlate with El Nino frequency. Uh, but before doing that, of course, we're talking about species level taxonomic identifications, which on rabbits and hares are pretty hard to do. Um, the best uh, taxonomic ID methods for rabbits and hares are based on teeth. But despite otherwise excellent preservation at this site, uh, most of the, the cranial specimens are without teeth. All the, all the soft tissue has, uh, has gone away and the teeth have all fallen out. So. Uh, I, I developed a, a discriminant function analysis on um, measurements of aspects of the skulls of these animals um, using a bunch of reference specimens from museums uh, all over the country. Um, I had to travel to, to Berkeley to the Mu Museum of Vertebrate Zoology there um, and took a bunch of measurements of, of skulls of these animals and was able to use those to get a taxonomic um, identification of these specimens. A third expectation we might have for the, the Escorpiolis lagomorph fauna is uh, based on an expectation from population demography. Um, expanding populations uh, typically have age structures skewed towards younger individuals and declining populations tend to have age structures skewed towards older. So we should expect uh, the relative abundance of uh, young specimens to, to be positively correlated with El Nino frequency. And we simply get at this using a fusion index, which is the sum of unfused divided by the sum of unfused and fused uh, long bones. So with all that set up, um, I'll switch to the results now. 
Uh, the first expectation, we should see higher total numbers of identified specimens when El Nino is more frequent. And that is in fact what we see at this site. We see a strong positive correlation uh, when El Nino is largely absent, uh, the numbers of identified specimens of lagomorphs are low. And when El Nino is very frequent, um, we typically get relatively high numbers of uh, lagomorphs deposited at this site. And we can see this in the scatter plot. And we can also see this in this time series showing the frequency of El Nino events compared to um, the Escorpionis lagomorph numbers of identified specimens. With, res with, ex re with respect to the second expectation uh, that we should see more mesic lagomorphs at the site, this, this pattern is also observed. When El Nino is infrequent, we tend to have lower numbers for the brush rabbit index. And when El Nino is very frequent, we tend to have um, only high numbers of the brush rabbit index. So when El Nino is more frequent, brush rabbits become the dominant lagomorph of this population. The third expectation that we should see more juveniles when El Nino is more frequent is also met. Um, we do see higher fusion index values when El Nino is more frequent and lower when it's absent. So what we see here is that El Nino and Eastern Pacific sea surface temperatures have a controlling effect on the lagomorph population of Northern Baja, California. More frequent El Nino results in absolutely more individuals, uh, relatively more individuals of the mesic taxa and relatively more young individuals deposited. And what this tells us is that lagomorphs do record the key to productivity of terrestrial versus marine resources associated with this patch. And after identifying this relationship, we've tried to think of a variety of ways to test it with the other, uh, the other taxa at the site. And we can see this relationship in every faunal index that we can think of. For example, uh, these two panels show quails which are the most abundant bird taxon at the site, and they are positively correlated with El Nino frequency, as are just as the uh, subadult lagomorphs are, the subadult quails are also positively correlated with El Nino frequency. But what about marine resources? Um, and we see the same, uh, the same expected patterns, which is that we should expect marine resources to decline at the site when El Nino is more frequent, and that, that in fact is what we observe. Uh, the marine, uh, the marine avifauna, the marine birds, are negatively correlated with El Nino. The birds that specifically breed in the Pacific Ocean, uh, so they have rookeries uh, in the Pacific and are dependent on uh, consistent sea surface temperatures, are negatively correlated with El Nino frequency. The extinct flightless duck Candides is negatively correlated with El Nino. And this, this case actually might provide us evidence that El Nino played a role in the extinction of Candides. At this site, uh, Candides were extirpated by about 5,000 years ago. Um, that's when we see the last Candides specimen here. Uh, in, northern, in more northern contexts in the Santa Barbara Basin, however, um, Candides uh, persisted until perhaps as late as 3,000 years ago. Uh, and it's frequently cited as a case of human overhunting causing extinction. Um, but this site actually gives us evidence that perhaps El Nino played a significant role in their extinction as well, because as we'll see, when El Nino is frequent, uh, humans are generally not around here. So if El Nino is causing the Candides to go away, humans aren't around. So we can rule them out at this site, at least in being responsible for Candides local extirpation from Northern Baja, California. And then with this fish index, the kelp, the kelp bass to surf perch, this is a measure of relatively cold water and kelp dependent fish taxa relative to surf perch, which are near shore habitat generalists and can, can tolerate higher sea surface temperatures. And we also see um, the same pattern here. The, the more cold water dependent fish are significantly whacked back by the frequency of El Nino events. As I mentioned, the proximity to marine resources, marine resources at this site means that human, human inhabitants of this site should treat the site functionally as a marine patch. When marine productivity is high, people should target this resource. And when marine productivity is low, they should abandon it. So there are some clear implications for human foraging and settlement patterns from these relationships. Um, and again, I'm gonna be using the patch choice model here. Um, 
And based on that, we, we can make some simple predictions about the archaeological assemblage at this site. We should see uh, a negative relationship between El Nino frequency and artifact frequency, a negative relationship between El, El Nino frequency and human modification of bone specimens. And because the site, when humans abandon the site, uh, raptor activity might increase um, just because humans tend to keep raptors away from rock shelters while they're inhabiting the sites, we might see a positive relationship with raptor modified bones and El Nino frequency. And then uh, we have a, a lot of radiocarbon dates from the site. We have about 98 radiocarbon dates at this point. And um, many of those radiocarbon dates are from charcoal uh, that humans were clearly involved in. And so the human history, the human radiocarbon history of the site uh, should also show a negative relationship with El Nino frequency. And what we see is that all these, 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 all these predictions are also met. Um, so artifact frequency over time at the site is negatively correlated with El Nino frequency. When El Nino is absent, we tend to see higher use of the site and more artifacts um, produced by humans deposited at the site. We also see this in the human modified bones at the site. When El Nino is absent, uh, relatively more human modified bones are at the site. Uh, again, evidence that of more intense human use of the site. And then also we see a positive relationship between raptor damage and El Nino frequency. When, when the El Nino is less frequent, uh, raptors tend to be more involved in the deposition of specimens at the site. And then finally, we also see this as expected in the radiocarbon, uh, in the radiocarbon history of the site. This is a summit probability distribution of just the charcoal dates at the site compared to the frequency of El Nino events. And again, we see that when El Nino is absent, human use of the site is high. And when El Nino is more frequent, uh, humans tend to abandon the site. So to conclude with, with this case study, El Nino is the paleoenvironmental factor driving the greatest variation in marine versus terrestrial resource patches in this part of Northern Baja, California. And the patch choice model and El Nino explain the greatest amount of variation in the human exploitation of marine resource patches in Baja, California. I just have a note here. Uh, I tend to be kind of reserved when I give this talk and I've actually been criticized by that by my peers. Um, when I talk about this privately with them, I'm very excited about this work. I'm very proud of this work. Um, my work with the rabbits and hares here represents the first documented millennial scale uh, relationship between a specific climate system, in this case El Nino, <clears throat> and any vertebrate population anywhere. So I think this is awesome. Um, even if I might sound a little dry about it. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch gears uh, now and talk about legacies of indigenous land use and how that shaped um, past wildfire regimes in the Basin Plateau region of Utah. Um, so up till now, I've been talking about variability in environments as recorded in these sites and how that affects human decision making, such as patch choice. But in this case study, I will show how human behavior itself can influence um, variation in those paleoenvironmental records. And I'll do this using a paper that just came out a few days ago. Um, this paper compares a sedimentary charcoal based fire history from Fish Lake in central Utah to the frequency of radiocarbon dates from Fremont sites in Sevier County, Utah. Uh, and many of you, uh, should be familiar with the Fremont. Um, very briefly, the Fremont is an archeological complex that occurred in more or less uh, the modern state of Utah between about 500 and 1300 AD. And the Fremont are a really cool group from a behavioral ecology standpoint because not only did they transition from foraging to farming, which is a huge subsistence change, but they kept foraging to a high degree and even switched back and forth over time. And, and as with choosing marine or terrestrial resource patches, choosing farming or wild food foraging is fundamentally a patch choice issue. And the relative profitability of wild versus agricultural resources are a key to understanding variability in Fremont subsistence. So here we'll look at how the Fremont influence return rates for wild terrestrial resources through burning activities. And there are, of course, a variety of ways people can modify their investment in agriculture and farming activities. Um, for example, tilling, irrigation, weeding, uh, those things all 
change the patch productivity. But what li likely dis dictates investment in agriculture for the Fremont was wild food returns. Um, basically, it boils down to only when wild food foraging sucks should you bother investing in, in agriculture. And of course, this is often ignored, but there are ways to invest in wild food patches as well. We know, for example, that fire is one of the tools that can be used to modify return rates for wild food resources. Um, so we cored Fish Lake in 2014, and one of the central questions we wanted to ask with this record was what's controlling fire on a landscape level in prehistory? Uh, there are ecological fire controls, uh, of course, um, climate or drought, uh, fuel accumulation, ignition sources. Those are all the ecological controls of fire on a landscape level. But if you can rule those out and you can show that humans um, were involved, um, they're the only explanation left. So why do people burn the landscape? Uh, we have at this point decades of ethnographic literature showing in Australia, for example, uh, people burn, people set fires to clear vegetation, to increase encounter rates with goannas, and to aid uh, in their in their basic excavation of goannas. What happens is when they burn the landscape and then the goannas running around leave tracks that they can track the goannas and then the goannas uh, burrow into holes and burning the landscape allows the people to find them much easier. So it increases their encounter rates with this prey taxon. Some side effects of burning are that uh, in areas where humans burn the landscape, we tend to have more smaller patches, uh, more habitat heterogeneity, more successional stages of different habitat types. And that higher number of habitats um, ha of patches creates more ecotonal space. And ecot ecotones uh, tend to benefit hab habitat generalists. And some of the important habitat generalists that people like in Western Australia are emu and kangaroo. So, they get a, an increase in encounter rates today for goanna hunting. And then over the years, they develop these uh, heterogeneous habitats that increase encounter rates with other animals on a long-term scale. And just briefly in this, uh, in this panel here, what we see is uh, satellite imagery, um, off-color satellite imagery from Western Australia. And the B panel is a anthropogenic fire regime and the C panel is a landscape under a lightning caused fire regime. And this just shows an example of the habitat homogeneity that results in natural fire regimes in panel C versus the habitat heterogeneity um, in panel B. So this is really dramatically altering the landscape and um, increasing return rates for wild food foraging. Uh, in California also, uh, we, we also have uh, decades of ethnographic uh, research showing native peoples burn for a variety of reasons, including to clear oak groves of woodland debris to make acorn harvesting easier. Um, it also kills grubs eating the acorns, so it increases the storability of the resource. Um, so again, we're increasing our encounter rates and our foraging efficiency by, by burning the landscape. And of course, we as archaeologists want to know uh, can we use, we, we as archaeologists want to know, can we detect the human use of fire in these paleoenvironmental records? Um, one common feature of paleoenvironmental literature is a researcher will find some, some spikes in charcoal frequency and then identify a nearby site with a radiocarbon date uh, close to that. And they'll say, oh, well, this is humans causing fire uh, with really no uh, statistical or a hypothesis testing approach to demonstrating a human link with fire. So this paper that I'm talking about is, is really novel in that we have found a way in this case uh, with these data sets to test the impact of various ecological controls on fire and rule them out. Uh, and then this clearly demonstrates the human role in the history of fire at this site. So this is the area we're talking about here. Um, the black line shows us Sevier County and down in the right, on the bottom right, we see the Fish Lake. We see Fish Lake and the little triangle there is the area that we cord. The white dots in this site are Fremont aged archeological sites. And we summed up all the radiocarbon dates from all these sites to generate uh, a human population history of this site. And that's what we use to compare 
against the charcoal record and the, the pollen, uh, the pollen-based paleoenvironmental proxies that we use to rule out vegetation and climate. <clears throat> So these are the results that, that we found comparing um, all these paleoenvironmental proxy data to the human population history of the site. Um, up at the top, we can see the charcoal-based fire history of the site. Uh, the, second, um, the second part of the panel is the sum probability distribution of Fremont radiocarbon dates at the site. And then we have a, a measure of the Palmer drought severity index over time. So this gets at drought over time, which is a significant ecological control of fire. And then uh, because everyone always says, what about El Nino? We, we also compared uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index over time to this charcoal record. And then we also compared uh, the arboreal pollen to the non-arboreal pollen uh, at this site as a measure of fuel accumulation over, site, over time. That's actually this F panel. Um, and what we found was uh, the only variable with significant predictive power for the fire history of this site is in fact human population density. Um, the Palmer drought severity index doesn't do it. The arboreal pollen to non-arboreal pollen doesn't do it. El Nino is actually negatively correlated with fire frequency at this site. Uh, only human population density has a significant relationship with fire history at this site. And to date, this is the best evidence of prehistoric landscape management with fire. It is apparent that the Fremont were uh, attempting to increase return rates in terrestrial resource patches through burning to further explore. Whoa. Oh, there should be a period in my notes here. It is apparent that the Fremont were attempting to increase returns in terrestrial resource patches through burning. Um, and this, this final panel, this is just three of those uh, data sets. The bottom panel here is, um, it really shows us the key to why people are burning the landscape in this case. This is a measure of the non-arboreal pollen that is not paleoethnobotanically significant. So a species that humans don't need or don't want to, to target relative to the paleoethnobotanically significant plant taxa. Um, and this of course is the pollen from this site. So the non-arboreal pollen that's not uh, something people want to the non-arboreal pollen that is something that people want. And what we can see is uh, as fire becomes more frequent on the landscape, um, the relative abundance of the pollen of plants that people don't want declines. So people are increasing the, the abundance of paleoethnobotanically significant plants um, as measured in this pollen record by burning. Um, so just to kind of wrap this up, uh, I myself have some experimental data that directly speak to this um, use of fire to uh, increase encounter rates with wild food uh, resources. So I've been engaged in research since 2010 in uh, generating data regarding the effects of fire on underground storage organ resources, specifically in this case, uh, wild onion on the Colorado Plateau. And this is research that I've been doing at the University of Utah's uh, Bonderman Field Station at Rio Mesa. Every spring when the onions are out in bloom, uh, we travel down to the site on the banks of the Dolores River near the town of Moab, and we throw down our little PVC quadrats, and we count uh, about 400 little uh, samples of onion patches. And then in 2015, this took quite a lot of justification and, and work with the, the committee that manages the site, um, but they eventually let me burn this, uh, a sample of these patches uh, in 2015 in late winter before the new growth came up. And these data show uh, the effect of that burning on the wild onions in these resource patches. The, patch on, the, the plot on the left, these are two subsamples of one patch um, the black line here is the patch that I never burned. And the green line here is the patch that I later burned in 2015. And these first four uh, pairs of data points should, should let you know that these two uh, resource patches are functionally identical. Um, there's no statistical difference 
between the unburned and the burned before I burned them. After I burned in 2015, however, uh, these two patches are no longer identical. Uh, there's a significant increase in uh, wild onions in the form of stem counts. Um, so actual onions above the ground. Uh, I don't have data that actually speak to the number of bulbs in the ground and that's uh, something I'd like to develop in the future. But at this point I have stem counts. And for the first year after the burn, there were significantly more onions in the patches that I burned. And then even in the second year after I burned, there was still a statistically significant increase in the number of onions in those patches. But then by the third and the fourth year, um, they're back to indistinguishable from each other. So these data directly show that burning these onion patches increases in counter rates with onions. So circling back to the Fish Lake record, um, this is what we think is happening with the charcoal record from this site. Um, in the farming situation before about 500 years ago, uh, farmers and foragers were using fire to manage fields and wild patch resources. Farming was abandoned after about 500 years ago in Utah, and uh, it looks like foragers after 500 years ago were ma principally managing uh, wild resource patches uh, up until the historic period when Euro-American settlement started happening and we started having a, a, a management um, goal of fire suppression. Uh, and then you add drought to that and we have a dominantly lightning caused and, and um, not management oriented, but human caused um, fire system. Um, and I should just note here, this is not just about how people did things in the past with records like this, but this, this study has clear implications for modern resource management as well. Uh, we need to start thinking about how to stop burning our forests down. Um, and one way we can stop burning our forests down is actually by burning our forests a little bit. Um, and with that, uh, I think I'm gonna end it here. I hope this short presentation has shown the utility of my approach to archeology. span I think we can really get a lot by applying formal models from behavioral ecology, but we get more uh, when we combine those models with fine grain records of paleo environmental change. Um, we actually get some pretty powerful explanatory tools about the archeological record. In these cases, we've figured out, whoops, the dominant climate controls on human settlement in Northern Baja, California over the whole scene. And in central Utah, we identified how to detect anthropogenic fire in a sedimentary charcoal record. These case studies are examples of how paleo environmental change influences the energetics of different patches, how that can influence opportunities for humans and how humans can actually influence patch productivity and the paleo environmental records of fast ecological change themselves. So with that, um, I just wanna thank everybody for being here, even though I was about 15 minutes late. Um, I think I have time to entertain some questions. Oh, I should bring up the, let's see. I'm not sure how the Zoom questions work. If you just unmute yourself and start talking, um, just go for it. There might be a question chat. Very interesting. Oh, so Eric Roberts, Eric Robertson says, very interesting. Thanks for your talk. The Snake River Plain lies along another key boundary for Enso, where the responses are different than they are down south. Can you potentially elaborate on how these processes could be addressed in the Snake River Plain? Um, my understanding with uh, the more or less um, modern margins of ENSO, uh, of the reach that ENSO has, um, is it is just right around uh, the Snake River Plain in terms of where El Nino uh, causes increases in precipitation, in winter precipitation. 
um, a more dominant part of the climate system that probably affects uh, the Snake River Plain is actually La Nina events. Um, La Nina events tend to bring uh, a very similar significant increase in, in precipitation um, to the northwestern part of North America. Um, I, in terms of archaeology on the Snake River Plain, um, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. I don't know probably enough about the archaeology of the Snake River Plain. Um, yeah, I don't think I can speak directly to that question. Um, but I'm certainly willing to entertain any suggestions about how to do that. Um, another question. Oh. That's not a question. Can legacy collections potentially be used to investigate this problem? Um, absolutely, I would say. Uh, one issue is the older collections tend to get uh, the more selective people were about what they were uh, collecting. But especially with respect to um, like chemical analyses of of faunal specimens, for example. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but I do have a, a small data set with respect to stable oxygen isotopes of rabbits and hares and how uh, they're, they're actually correlated with El Nino frequency and sea surface temperature um, in Baja, California. And so even in collections where maybe the researchers were selective about what they were, were collecting and didn't collect uh, you know, a, a representative sample of whatever animal um, you're interested in, uh, those collections certainly have uh, sufficient numbers of specimens for things like stable isotope analyses. Um, and there are some pretty clear uh, predictions we can make about how, for example, oxygen isotopes should vary in these assemblages based on the frequency of El Nino events. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's a number of other ways we could use legacy collections. Um, to investigate this problem. After the Lagomorph research, do you see additional opportunities to connect climate events to vertebrate ecology, particularly here in the West? Um, I do. Uh, and actually another research project that I've been working on is uh, based in the Lake Bonneville Basin of Western Utah. Uh, uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Lake Bonneville. It was a large terminal Pleistocene uh, lake that occurred from about 30,000 to 15,000 years ago in Western Utah and extended uh, essentially up into Southern Nevada and South almost into, um, sorry, extended up into Southern Idaho and, and South almost to uh, Arizona to the South. Uh, so a huge lake. And uh, after it went away, uh, it left behind a vast marsh system uh, in the Dugway Proving Ground area of Utah. And we've been taking sediment cores in that area to uh, generate some of these paleoenvironmental records, um, uh, specifically about hydrology, um, but also about uh, precipitation and, and vegetation response to hydrology. And um, one question that we want to ask of these data sets is how do these variations that we see in productivity of, of springs and rivers and wetlands, uh, how do those affect vertebrate ecology at these sites? Um, one, one big problem with, or one big question I should say with the Paleo Indian settlement of, of the old riverbed delta is that there's a toolkit made up of large stone tools and almost nothing else. And it's frequently read to indicate uh, people were out there hunting big game animals. Um, but we don't have any evidence other than the stone tools that people were actually hunting big game animals. Um, the one site that we have subsistence data from on the old riverbed delta uh, of western Utah is completely dominated by duck bones. The, the only site that we have subsistence data suggests people are out eating duck bones, um, even though their toolkit is often read by archaeologists to be a big game hunting specialist toolkit. 
another problem with this is that in general, um, the early Holocene climate was marked by extreme seasonality. Um, there's evidence that summers were hotter and drier than today and winters were actually colder and wetter. And that tends to have uh, really negative effects on artiodactyl and other large mammal populations. And that might actually explain part of the extinction of large mammals at the end of the Pleistocene. And so given these uh, climate, this climate that says artiodactyls should be um, depressed on the landscape um, and the toolkit that says perhaps people are hunting artiodactyls, but the subsistence data that says people are eating ducks, um, it's, it's still a big mess. And there is a lot of work to be done uh, out there to connect these climate events to uh, natural history and to archeological uh, assemblages. Thanks for the question. Any questions here in the room? I think our earlier question about the, uh, the hash protocol and the size of the, uh, what is the organic mm -hmm. site? Yeah, I'm so thinking about what people are eating and by its breath, you know, affects how they choose their hashes, right? Like what hash is what are you looking for? And then I was wondering how you were evaluating hash quality. Is it just like, Return rate? Is that we assume that caloric return rates are correlated with patch quality and that's that's what we think is driving the use of the site so people are there when their foraging return rates on marine resources are good. Um, we, we of course can't get at um, the inland uh, return rates that were available to people by abandoning the coastal site and moving inland the El Nino frequency, of course, suggests that it should have been uh, a relatively productive inland setting during that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, what kind of marine resources are they exploring? Uh, when I've gone to that site, I walk right out off the ledge into, it's, it's not a beachy site, there's like a volcanic rock, uh, and I collect great big mussels just right in the tidal zone and it's a very abundant mussel fishery. Um, there are some, there is limited evidence, but it does exist of things like fish hooks at this site. So people are using, are using the fish resources. Um, they're probably, uh, when they were there, uh, there is evidence in the form of three, I think, candidi specimens with cut marks. So people were exploiting the Candides, that's that large extinct flightless duck. Um, so the people there were exploiting a wide array of, of marine foods. Yeah, I'm curious because, you know, mussels are still kind of, you know, large, you get ones that still kind of lower like sea surface, right? Um, I, don't know, I don't know what the return rates are like. Mine are pretty good. I can collect a five gallon bucket of mussels in about 20 minutes. <laughs> They they open up when you cook them. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I'm just thinking about the a little butter and some Chardonnay in there. Good questions that we hope to yeah, expand into. Look at, so. Yeah, and that's the beauty of this site. Uh, I mentioned, you know, it's got a lot of things in it. There are literally hundreds of thousands of faunal specimens in this assemblage. Um, I like, I used to like to say millions, but I've been corrected a couple times. Maybe only seven or eight hundred thousand <laughs> faunal specimens at this site, and they are of every vertebrate taxon that occurs in northern Baja California today. All the birds all the reptiles, all the mammals, all the, the marine species. And this site is really gonna be a gold mine moving forward um, for paleo environmental research and archeological research. 
everything. Yeah. Oh well. Again, again, it's a this is a mixed assemblage. It's a lot of raptor activity and a lot of human activity. For example, we don't think humans are targeting um, the the uh, voles or the shrews at the site. The shrews, there's a, a significant shrew assemblage at this site, the vagrant shrew of Northern Baja, California. There's a lot of those. Uh, we don't think people are eating those. They're about this big, probably impossible to catch. So it's figuring out which animals uh, humans ate and which animals raptors ate is probably not gonna happen um, just because there's so many and you know, how can you tell? But we can look at this bigger picture of patch use or settlement over time from, from a kind of zoom out bigger picture question. One thing from, from foraging theory, however, um, rabbits and hares uh, are clearly in um, the optimal diet of humans since time immemorial in North America. Um, experimental process, experimental return rates for rabbits and hares puts them in the, I think, 20 to 30,000 calories an hour uh, range. Um, and at that, uh, there isn't, there hasn't been a diet in North American prehistory that wouldn't have included those, if you think of it from an optimal foraging perspective. And so basically, humans should be taking them in direct proportion to their existence on the landscape because they're always in the diet. And that should be the case for raptors as well. Um, the, the difference in body size between these animals, if that drives any variation in return rates, isn't big enough to add one to the diet and rule the other ones out. Does that make sense? So the, the question of relative raptors versus humans, um, there's justification to kind of ignore that, <laughs> is what I'm saying. I mean, I'm looking into research, and I'm thinking, like, well, I thought I ever explained those resources yesterday. That was really the diet. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that the, the, the reason so many rabbit bones end up in this assemblage is because birds have a, a little bit wider foraging radius than people do. Birds are out on the landscape, um, you know, getting rabbits from up to five or 10 miles away. And then in just a couple of seconds, they can be back at this site. And so the, the ability of, of birds to go get specimens is greater than the ability of people. And so it's probably an oversampling of, of raptor activity at this site. Whereas if people are there, um, the terrestrial resources aren't dense enough on the landscape to get people to hang around there very long. So real, what's that? Um, we, we are assuming that both humans and raptors are faithful samplers of the lagomorph population. And so if the lagomorph population is a function of El Nino, whether humans are there or, rap, or raptors are principally there, the numbers being deposited are gonna be similar. And especially that really shows the benefit of this, of the multi-proxy kind of throw everything at the wall approach where we look at relative taxonomic abundance of mesic species, actual numbers of identified specimens, um, the young versus old of the population. Um, if, it, if there was some effect of humans not being there, you know, make, meaning um, that might be affecting the, the numbers of identified specimens, um, by looking at all these other indices, we can say that everything in together all points to the same conclusion. Does that make sense? I have a quick follow on question, then we should probably go to the next thing. So you said that habitation of sites occurs a little bit later than was expected. Uh, then was, yeah, then was hoped. Sort of general you know, population movements. That could be. Um, it could also be the case that uh, the materials that they excavated were, in fact, that old. We, we've submitted a bunch of radiocarbon dates from specimens in the very bottom layer of the site, and it's a really mixed 
jumbled layer of, uh, we call them paramineralized um, bones. They're almost fossils and they have very little radiocarbon, um, radiogenic carbon. And so we've, we've submitted a bunch of those for dates and we don't get dates from them because there's not enough carbon because they're fossils essentially. So it could be the case that the people were there, um, but the radiocarbon dates don't quite show that. Um, so there's, there's radiocarbon limitations because it's this, um, bones fossilize a lot quicker in shell middens than in other kinds of sites. And so if there's a lot of fossilization already underway. Okay.